All right, so what I want to do now with this module is kind of walk you through some of the different crystal defects that we can image using TEM. And these are the types of defects that are very uh, atomic level. And so we can't necessarily see them using other techniques, uh, even SEM in some cases, uh, and definitely not light microscopy. So these are uh, some of the very common usage for TEM is to be able to see uh, crystal defects. And so I want to kind of walk you through the, the various things that we can see. Uh, but there won't be a lot of de uh, detail here. So um, I, if you are interested in this, you're going to need to kind of look up more about um, each one of these types of defects. I just want to walk you through what what's possible with TEM. Um, and the first one is wedge uh, fringes. So these are generated um, at the, uh, these can be generated at the edge of a thin foil sample. So the type that we have in SEM, or sorry, in TEM. Um, and, you know, so the, the shape is kind of like this, as you might see. Um, it can also happen uh, near grain boundaries. And so here you kind of see this wedge shape crystal. And so the, the lines here are indicating um, uh, the orientation of, the, uh, of a certain set of planes. And so the wedge fringe uh, manifests itself as kind of a periodic light dark that you see. And it's caused by the deviation from uh, Bragg's law. So again, we have kind of our incident electron, you can think of as, as wave, um, compared to the diffracting plane that we see here. Sorry about that. Um, and so this occurs because we have a continuously changing thickness um, in the, the thickness of these uh, planes. And so that's why we have these uh, light dark differences and we see uh, these wedge fringes so you can kind of see here and that's corresponding to the intensity that you see down here so we can also see uh, these same kind of wedge fringes um, as the result of stacking faults so you might remember uh, from something like MSC 201 the stacking fault is essentially uh, an error in the stacking sequence so we should have a b c a b c but in this case we're missing uh, b and then um, it picks up back over over here so basically in that area we would call that a, a stacking fault and so basically the edges of those fringes that we see in over here um, are the locations of those partial dislocations that separate the stacking fault from the rest of the, the crystal. So basically, that fringe is the, the stacking fault in uh, the material. So we can also see them slightly differently um, in uh, stacking faults. All right, uh, another type of defect that we um, can sometimes see um, is and this is when we're in diffraction contrast mode, is these bend contours. So again, if you imag imagine our sample as a thin sample, uh, oftentimes it can get uh, slightly bowed or bent. Um, and so the angle um, of the planes is therefore slightly bent as well. And so the uh, orientation of this plane relative to this one is slightly different and therefore um, if it doesn't satisfy Bragg's law in this case at some point it might and so where it does you see this darkened region because it's scattering the light and so you basically see a dark region because that light is scattered away from the aperture and so and because uh, the the material is bent in this way you see them uh, in sets so this is the HKL and this is the negative uh, of those HKL values. And so we tend to see them in sets because of the way this would be bent either in this direction or in this direction. It would satisfy the angle in both 
cases. And so that's kind of what you're seeing over here is those darkened regions are areas where uh, diffraction is, is occurring with respect to the orientation that we have. So that can be caused uh, from, from that as well. But we only have partial, we don't have full satisfying of, the, of Bragg's law in those cases. Um, so one thing to keep in mind is that these bend contours we, we're, we've talked about here, um, in this case, look very similar to another thing that we're gonna talk about, which is uh, dislocation. So this is an example of dislocations over here. Uh, the important thing to note here though, is that if we're unsure of which is which, we can test it because bend contours are gonna be sensitive to tilt and moving, right? Because if you think back to here, if we tilt this mach this, um, this, uh, this sample, different parts of the crystal are gonna satisfy Bragg's law. And so we're gonna get differences in where these fringes appear. And so it'll appear to have moved. Whereas dislocations um, are uh, not as sensitive to that same uh, effect. And so that's uh, basically, again, tilt can be used as a way to test between bin contours and dislocations. All right, so now we get to dislocations. And this is often one of the things that's cited about the advantages of TEM. And, you know, I've probably mentioned multiple times and particularly in lab as well, you know, dislocations are atomic level things, right? They are, you know, the, the movements between relative planes. And so we can't see dislocations on light microscopy. The resolution just isn't high enough. Even SEM um, is not high enough. And so to really see dislocations or the effect of dislocations, we need uh, TEM. And so this is some different uh, uh, examples of looking at dislocations. And so the, the first ones here down in the, the bottom left are kind of randomly distributed. So you have a dislocation line and it's represented by the dark color in this. And so you can kind of see it random, just kind of like, you know, it's almost like spaghetti uh, around in this image. Whereas the rest of the image uh, is uh, what we, you know, kind of a perfect crystal with no uh, defects. Um, you can also see uh, dislocations that actually line up. So again, this is a small section of a dislocation in a uh, single crystal. Um, and then um, you can see kind of them line up in a given um, uh, slip plane. And so you can see them kind of in these very uh, structured lines um, as they move through the, the crystal. Um, you can also see in more complex and more um, advanced kind of higher dislocation densities, um, you can often find dislocations that form these cell structures. So it almost looks like a grain structure, but the uh, boundaries here are uh, sort of intense uh, tangling of dislocations uh, that form in this way so that all the dislocations are kind of organized uh, in these areas, and then the rest of the crystal is relatively defect free. So this is kind of, this is what's referred to as a dislocation cell structure. So this is common in some types of materials. All right, so if we want to kind of try to figure out why dislocations can actually be visualized, we can kind of think of a um, edge dislocation. So this is a diagram up here showing an edge dislocation. Here's the extra half plane. And so the area around that extra half plane we call the dislocation core because that's where there is a strain in uh, the, the lattice because there effectively is uh, missing atoms here and extra ones up here. So we have uh, strain in, involved there. And again, this is a crystalline structure. And so we can have dislocation, or sorry, uh, diffraction uh, contrast. And so what happens is if we sort of envision um, the uh, incident electron beam coming in at this angle, 
um, at this point in the, the core, we can actually have uh, at a certain angle um, in this core, because there's kind of bending here, that the same thing can happen as in bend contours. You can get just the right angle, and so we get deflection at that spot, and so that area will look darker because those electrons are getting deflected or diffracted uh, into another uh, location and therefore not going through the aperture. And so um, it's really similar to, to bend contours because only a s select part of that uh, will um, deflect electrons and that's going to appear dark. And so if we're looking at the intensity, that's what we see here is we see a darkening around the, the core in this case. Um, so in, in this case, uh, if you were kind of going back to the, the lineup that we saw, um, in this case, the, um, the, the lined up dislocations, if you're kind of wondering why they're sort of getting cut off, they're actually getting cut off because we have a thin sample. And so um, this dislocation line, you can kind of imagine cutting through that thin sample. And so it's truncated by the top and the bottom of the, the sample. And so that's why you only see a thin line that you see here. Because again, we're looking at an image that's two dimensional, but it's representing a, um, a, a various kind of plane or, or line in this three dimensional model. So that's where that kind of cutoff um, is coming from. All right, uh, so another thing about dislocations is that we can also have some um, sort of, uh, there is some dependency on the angle, but it's much more extreme than what you see in bin contours. Uh, because again, the, the circumstance we imagined before was when the, um, the uh, incident beam was uh, perpendicular to the what's called the Burgers vector in this edge dislocation. And so we saw that cause in this position um, a uh, diffraction from diffract, uh, diffraction contrast. We saw a darkening at that spot. And so we saw differences there. However, if the orientation is um, 90 degrees different, so the incident beam is um, parallel to the Burgers vector in this case, um, then that same type of um, diffraction contrast uh, doesn't occur in, in this case because of the orientation. But again, it's 90 degrees, which is not something we can typically do with those tilt holders. And so that's why we could say that there was a orientation dependency for bend contours and not here because this is an extreme uh, version of this. So in this very specific case, then we don't see any difference. And so we don't see this dislocation if that um, Burgers vector in this case is parallel to the beam. And so we call that the invisibility criteria for dislocations, and that can result in not being able to, uh, to see those, which is uh, something of interest to us. All right, so we can often see twins appear, annealing twins or, uh, or uh, um, other types of twins appear in SEM or light microscopy. Um, however, we get some um, additional information here. So um, we have sort of um, extra uh, reflections. So we can see it in uh, basically um, other types of light micro, uh, including light microscopy. But here, the interesting thing is that in uh, diffraction mode, so if we look at diffraction, we can actually see uh, now instead of just one spot for a particular set of HKL planes, we actually see extra reflections or spots like you see here. And so that's of use because that tells us uh, that we're looking at an area with twins. So this extra spot that occurs is from twins. So we can visualize it, but we can also see it or see the effects in diffraction mode. Um, all right. So another uh, thing that um, 
the feature that we can kind of uh, kind of see here is what we call moray fringes and this is um something that happens commonly in thin films but if you kind of imagine um uh, a thin film of a uh, material so it's a single crystal and then you have another film or thin film on top but they're at um differing angles kind of like you see in this example so we have one orientation a and then b is slightly off on top of it so we have kind of multiple layers of a um, crystalline material and again that's why you tend to see this in thin films then the sort of diffraction uh, interference between those two which you might you might be able to see in, in other kind of uh, examples of this uh, on the macro scale, but you end up with these um, very um, uh, periodic patterns or moray fringes that you see here from the overlap of those two crystal structures. So it's an overlapping pattern that you see uh, as a result of overlapping crystals. So that's something that you can see in thin films and particularly TEM of thin films.